Imagine if a third of the population is ill all at the same time. Imagine if you had no electricity for three months. Imagine if all of the ways that you typically got food um, were cut off from you. Imagine if you don't speak English very well and you suddenly find out that your child's school is closed. You don't know why. Imagine you're an employer and all of a sudden, uh, within a week, one-third of your employees are no longer present. Imagine if we've got half the people at work that we normally have, it may take us a lot longer to get there. Imagine if uh, large numbers of healthcare workers uh, couldn't come to work. Imagine if I can't bring my own son to a hospital and have everything done to try to save his life. Imagine if your family, friends, all over the country, in fact all over the world, are going through the same thing you are at the same time. A pandemic is a global spread of, of influenza. It, it begins with a new influenza virus that emerges and since no one has immunity to a new virus, it can spread very quickly from person to person. We have these great peaks with these large pandemic waves, sort of like an, an infectious disease or a tsunami where it rolls into a community and there are many people who are susceptible, they become very ill very quickly. Even if only 10% of King County were to get it, in a county of 1.8 million people, that's 180,000 people who would get sick. It will affect everybody, whether it's loss of life or illness. Um, it will change uh, for a period of time how we live and how we work. It's really important for people to understand that we cannot prevent a pandemic. It's not really a matter of if, it's a question of when. The pandemic could involve three months of devastating impacts uh, to all of us. Um, we may see our economy wrecked. We may see no a number of businesses close. Many of our friends, some of our family may experience severe illness or even die. We will all know someone who's probably lost their job because of this event. Uh, this is going to be a long-term disaster. The impacts are going to be severe for many weeks to months. Just about everything we buy, sell, eat, wear, or otherwise consume uh, comes through a port of entry or otherwise is, is transported along our roads or railways. And during a pandemic, these types of systems could be significantly impacted. Life on the street will look very different. Um, buses will be much less crowded. Uh, walking into department stores or, or restaurants or coffee shops, people will be spaced apart from each other. Schools and licensed child care centers will likely be closed if it's a severe event. People will not be allowed to come into certain buildings if they're symptomatic, if they're coughing or sneezing. People will be directed to go home and not be allowed into certain buildings. All aspects of society will see a reduction in, in workforce due to absenteeism. When a pandemic hits, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to your community and it's going to cause problems. So we need to just think ahead to what might happen if our supplies are, are interrupted and if our resources aren't coming in and understand how we can make do for weeks or maybe months uh, under those circumstances and still survive. It's important during a pandemic that um, business and government and other organizations implement social distancing in their work environment. Influenza primarily spreads from these little droplets of uh, saliva that are expelled when someone coughs, sneezes, or talks. And so generally these droplets go between three and six feet and then fall out on the ground where they're no longer uh, harmful. So social distancing would mean whenever possible, keep three to six feet away from someone else during the time when the pandemic virus is circulating. The key is to keep your most critical functions running, but redesign your workplace so that uh, employees can stay three to six feet away from each other. They have a work environment uh, to do their jobs, but you're closing things like uh, common areas such as kitchens, you're regulating access to places like uh, coffee rooms, and you're conducting meetings differently. In a pandemic, an individual might practice social distancing by, for example, telecommuting to work, um, by walking to work rather than taking public transportation, uh, by going to a coffee shop and standing three to six feet apart from the other customers and at work uh, sitting in a, in a cubicle uh, or in an office space that's separated from their co-workers. It's important to start planning now for an influenza pandemic. When this event begins it's going to move so rapidly around the world 
that we just won't have time to start from scratch during the event. Uh, also, planning now actually helps us with all other hazards. Identifying your critical functions, ad identifying how you're going to take care of your employees uh, helps not just with the pandemic, but with all other types of hazards that uh, your organization might face. Be a little bit different. A little so bit. If I were a retailer, uh, or I were a small business person, I would ask the people who supply me the goods I wish to sell, do you have a pandemic flu plan? How can you assure me that I'm going to have what I need to stay in business? Uh, King County and every city has looked at its critical infrastructure, how to move people, uh, how to treat uh, waste, how to provide fire services, how to make sure the stoplights are running, the electricity is flowing. Um, I mean, the world's not going to stop. It's just going to be under the most acute stress that we've seen in over 100 years. If there's anything I can tell people, plan, 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 plan. Plan personally, government plans, that businesses have to plan because this will be an incredibly disruptive event with severe economic impacts for those that don't plan and a more limited but still severe impact for those people who do. The key is do you want to fall into the abyss and we can't retrieve you, or are you going to be at the edge of it? That's where we're going to be in a pandemic flu. Yeah, at 0700, is that, um, is that too early? Our biggest concern is during a pandemic outbreak, if we were to lose, with our planning assumption, 30 to 40 percent of our workforce, either being ill themselves or caring for someone that is ill, is how do we maintain the reliability of the electric grid across the United States? We've identified that we are reliant on many of our suppliers and vendors to provide us the materials we need to construct and maintain our electric and natural gas systems. So, we have as much concern about what they're planning to do for workforce shortage as much as what we're going to be able to do. We can only put up new poles and wire if we have the poles and wire to put them up. We recognize that in any normal major storm event that we share our qualified resources, our qualified electrical workers. In a pandemic outbreak, that will not be possible. The likelihood of us getting mutual aid or resources from out of the region are extremely limited. Customers expect us and will want to know whether we'll be able to respond to power outages, to natural gas service uh, delivery issues, um, public safety issues. And we're going back and looking at every business unit plan that was done for business continuity and saying, look at your plans from a pandemic scenario, looking at the 12 to 18 month time frame. Every year, Food Lifeline feeds um, well over half a million people. But we know that in the event of, a, of an emergency or a disaster or pandemic flu, the number of people who rely on our system is, is very much likely um, to increase and could increase pretty significantly. One of the things that we have to think about as an organization is um, to imagine if our own food sources were cut off. So what if we went on our regular pickup routes on a Monday and our truck came back empty? What if we ran out of food in distributing food to agencies and had no more to offer? These are all scenarios that we're working with and planning for so that in the event of an actual pandemic flu, we've known ahead of time what we would do in those circumstances. One of the things we need to be doing is cross-training our staff members, making sure that we've identified what the essential functions are in our organizations and that we have not one or two, but multiple people who are trained to step in and fulfill those essential functions. It's also really important to think about some of the really day-to-day -day aspects of your organization. How are you going to make sure that paychecks get cut? How are you going to make sure that the, the payments get made to your employee benefit plans? How are you going to ensure that, um, that you're able to account for sick days and vacation days? Um, what happens if an employee needs to be out for a far longer period of time than they have sick days saved up? Does that mean that you're going to take the same kinds of maybe punitive steps with an employee that you would in a non-emergency period of time? Probably not. One of the things that's, that's good news about this kind of planning is that it's not hard and it's not important that your preparedness plans be difficult or long or complex. They just need to be 
well thought out. In the event of a pandemic flu, there are some key elements that we really want the um, general public to know. One is that coming to the hospital most likely will not be the answer, number one, and number two, there's going to be huge issues of capacity. But if pan flu is rampant in the county, every hospital will be in the same situation in terms of running out of supplies. It's beds that we would run out of. It's the ventilators that we would run out of. My chances of borrowing from my neighborhood hospital for a supply that's critical to care of hand flu patients just will not happen. We believe that the planning that we're doing now, the stockpiling that we're doing now, all the plans that we're making now will ultimately benefit all of us to take better care of our patients and actually help survivability of our patients. Not responding is not an option for us. You know, some businesses have talked about telecommuting or alternate shift scheduling or maybe trying to do your work from home. If you've got a fire, we can't telecommute to that fire. If you've just crashed your car, we can't telecommute there. We have to be there in person. You know, what affects the hospital affects us. If the hospital is full and we can't take the patient there, we have to find another location to take them to. We can't drive around with them in the back of the rig until they get better. And this will be an emergency where 911 will also be severely challenged. Um, we will be dealing with many times our normal call volume. So we have to figure out how we can leverage um, the technology that we have now to address this increase of call volume. One of the issues we've tried to address is not just fire department preparedness, but personal preparedness for our people. Because if they're not prepared at home, they're not going to be able to be at work and be, able to be comfortable that their families are taken care of. So we have stressed over the last several years the importance of emergency preparedness. We've thought very long and very hard trying to understand what the impacts will be and how we will respond to those impacts. We have tried to address issues of personnel shortages of material shortages, fuel, equipment, supplies, um, how are we going to feed the 200 firefighters on duty when the grocery stores may or may not be open. It's a huge problem and preparing for it now we hope will make us much more successful in the event that it does happen. We're all equally disadvantaged in a pandemic. We looked at all of our most critical processes and we tried to figure out which of those processes would we continue to do the same way we do now, which of those would we have to reduce, and then which ones would we suspend for an extended period of time. How do we first of all protect our people and then how do we serve our customers at the same time? And I think pandemic is kind of the ultimate metaphor for business continuity planning. The more of it we do when we think about an extended duration, the better prepared we are in our regular plans. We've gone to um, our major funders, the municipal governments and state governments, and asked specifically, so if there is a pandemic flu, will we still get paid if we don't meet our, our numbers every month? Because that's what our contracts are based on. In the case of a pandemic flu at work here, we would do a number of things. One, the first thing is just basic hygiene. We do emphasize that we've used the signs provided by public health, and they're in all of our restrooms, and we encourage people to wash their hands frequently cover their sneezes and coughs. We do encourage even now, if you are sick, please do not come to work. We know that you're overworked, we know that you're underpaid, but if you come to work when you're sick, you're just gonna make me sick. And that means I can't work. And so that's something that we would emphasize even more in the case of pandemic flu. 
So it's really about the process. It's about sitting down together with your family, your loved ones, your staff, um, your clients at times, and working through the whole different scenarios and thinking through what might you do. The other thing that's really critical, I think, is working with all of your staff and your family, your own family, to make sure that you have your own personal emergency plan. Because if we can't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of our clients, and then we're no use to anyone. This is why we plan. Local governments, the healthcare sector, private industry, state and federal governments, community-based organizations, all working together to prepare for this catastrophic event. I think the most important thing is collaborative planning. People working together to share resources, to understand how they can uh, make the most of the resources that they have available. This is an ideal opportunity to network with other companies. And you could be the expert, or you could be the naive, just beginning to think about this person, but there are tremendous opportunities offered for collaboration. We need leadership. We need people that will not act out of fear. We expect our leadership from the CEO of our company, as well as corporate leaders uh, at the director level and all the officers, to message to their employees the importance of the policies and the procedures that we put in place. As a leader, you can, you can think about your emergency preparedness much in the same way as you can your strategic planning as an organization. If your strategic planning is not um, a living and breathing document that your entire staff knows about and is invested in and buys off on, um, then that document is um, as good as a doorstop. Life will not be the same after an event of this scale. It's not enough to plan for how you're going to deal with the emergency, but what's equally as important is planning for recovery, knowing how you as an agency or a company or a family will get back to normal, because life will go on. Rather than being terrified, what you have to assume is that people will get sick, people will get well, they will come back to work, they will go back to school, the humanness aspect of recovery is going to be really important to put in place in your workplace. So think about in your HR functions what kinds of, um, of practices you might want to, to put into place just to take care of people and to ensure um, that all of those um, emotions and things that we're all going to be grappling with um, have a place to show up and be dealt with. We want to take care of our own first. which is natural, um, but being generous with our resources and uh, skills and talents is something that we can do to make the recovery a little bit better. Uh, this is going to be a long-term disaster. The impacts are going to be severe for many weeks to months. Um, it's going to take a community-wide effort to get prepared for this type of event and certainly a community-wide effort uh, to recover. So imagine if you've planned the perfect plan for a pandemic outbreak and you knew that 30 to 40 percent of your workforce was not going to be available to assist you, you would have a plan in place to address only the critical functions that you need to perform. You'd have messaging to all of your employees and your customers about what they could expect from your company. You would have emergency supplies in the workplace. Your employees would be prepared at home with their families so that they could take care of themselves. And they would also have a plan to deal with children if schools are closed, etc., so that they can be available to come to work to assist you. Gosh, imagine if all of us do our part with planning and all of us are well organized at home and we are all able to come and do our jobs, that will make this be much less of a disaster. The imagine of scenarios um, can be good news or bad news, and you can change that depending on the extent to which you've done your planning. Your business is going to be key for this community getting back together. Your government agency is going to be truly important to make sure that the rest of us are able to um, do the recovery that we need to to come to back into a functional society. We've done our homework, it's time for you to do yours. <music>